Our speaker for this hour is Jack Gilchrist. Uh, you'd probably prefer that I read the book for his uh, bi biographical sketch, but one of the consistencies with the school is having, the, especially in the first year, is having the same teacher every Thursday. I know it's Wednesday, so I'm a little off, uh, but uh, Jack comes up every Thursday morning, teaches all day uh, Hebrew history and uh, is a very uh, good teacher. Some of the that we know can be a little bit dry, but Jack brings it to life. Jack is uh, a graduate of the school. He graduated in 2002. Uh, well, no, he graduated Free Harbor in 2002, then graduated here in 2005. He currently uh, preaches for the Pine Grove Church of Christ in Scott Debo, West Virginia. Jack and his wife Katie are married in 2002 and have one son, Andrew. And uh, we're glad that Jack has come up, comes up and works with the school, and we're glad that he can come up and speak on the lectureship. Thank you. I have to start off. First of all, thanking all of you for getting up this morning and coming and being here. It's uh, always great to see the devotion of individuals who want to hear the message of the Word preached and want to worship God together and the lectures as an opportunity to do so. Uh, I also want to just uh, brag on my wife a little bit uh, because, uh, as you are probably already aware, uh, she works on the lectureship book. Uh, she does the uh, copy editing. Um, she, she makes it look good. She fixes all our grammar mistakes. That's how, how come she makes it look so good and so well. Um, one of those. She'll tell me which one was right later. Uh, so uh, we appreciate her and all she does for the school with, with that work. And uh, that also means I get to read the lectureship book ahead of time. Uh, and it did become very apparent as reading the lectureship book ahead of time this year that everybody, as we heard especially yesterday, is setting the context because Romans 1 through 11 is so tightly interlocked with one another that, that pretty much every Every speaker says, well, I have to set the context because this is continuing on the previous thoughts or going from then to the next thoughts of somebody else's you know, speaking. And, and even, even in my assignment in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 20, we're building up to one of uh, uh, the most well-known verses, uh, surprisingly, probably one of the verses I quote most when I'm preaching, especially off the top of my head, is Romans 3, 23, which is not my assignment. But, you know, we're setting the context for that. We're, 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 we're essentially making a bed that Romans 3.23 sits in and, and why it's there. And so instead of setting the context for the whole book of Romans, like we, we heard so many times done so well yesterday, I'll first of all say, read your book. Uh, you'll get the context there. Uh, and secondly, and say, I'm going to more focus on setting the context for one verse that will come up tomorrow in the first lecture tomorrow morning. And that's Romans 3.23. Well, okay, I lied. So Romans 1, <laughs> but all seriousness, Romans 1 and 2 has spent a very efficient time in condemning both the Greeks, the Gentiles, and the Jews. And so by the time you get to Romans 3, if you're, if you're sitting in the original audience listening to this being read, by the time you get to Romans 3, you're just throwing your hands up going, what in the world? <laughs> And especially, you know, you, you, if, you're, if you're a Jew in that original audience, you hear Romans 1, and you're like, you got that right, Paul. You give it to him. And then you hear Romans 2, and you go, wait a second. I was with you for those first, you know, 26 verses. But, but now, you hit, you hit me. You hurt my feelings. I think inspiration has anticipated the objection of the Jew that would be listening to what is read in chapter 3. I, I think God, with all his wisdom and the Holy Spirit, with all his ability, has filled Paul with a message to say, and here's the questions you're going to get. Here's what people are going to be thinking as they listen to the first part of Romans read. And so we're just going to go ahead and answer those questions. We're going to anticipate them through inspiration and give them the answers because verse 1 starts with our title. What advantage then has the Jew or what profit of circumcision? 
You know, so, so if the Jews are condemned right next to the Gentiles, what good was any of those last 1,400 years where we were the chosen nation? What good did that do us to be the chosen nation if we're in the same boat as everybody else? Interestingly enough, you know, somewhere around 2,000 years after Romans has been written, we're still dealing with some of these, these same and similar issues of, of what is the Christian's relationship to the Old Testament, what is the Jew's relationship to the New Testament, and how are we all supposed to get along? One of my favorite questions to ask in class after where can we find the proto-evangelism is how many of the Ten Commandments do we keep today? And I'll always anticipate the usual answers. Ten, nine, or zero. And that's because for 2,000 years, We've been dealing with that same issue of how do Christians handle the Old Testament? How, how do we relate to that where that was the Jewish law given to them? Where that was what they were supposed to be following. And then we come along, Gentiles, Johnny come lately to this whole thing. And, and now how are we supposed to relate to those Ten Commandments? And how are we supposed to also be making sure we're keeping the New Covenant and encouraging Jews to keep the New Covenant? How does it all go together? And I almost think that's the model modern day application of our, our context here, these 20 verses, is so how do we view the Jews in their relationship to the old law? How do we view ourselves, our relationship to the Jewish law? And how do we move forward? Because that's the key. That's where, where Paul's trying to take them. He's trying to get them to move forward to get the next you know, eight chapters of Romans addressed to get people to talk about salvation and Christ and the centrality of grace and faith and, and obedience and what we all need to do. So we're setting the context for all of that when we start with this objection. What advantage then has the Jew or what profit or what is the profit of circumcision? Advantage and profit here, these words can, can imply preeminence, superiority. What makes the Jew better than the Gentile? And oddly enough, he's going to give an answer before we go, well, nothing. <laughs> There is an answer. There's a biblical answer to this question given in verse 2. Much in every way. They did have an advantage. What was it? Chiefly because to them were committed to oracles of God. They had the word of God. Now, if you'll give me a brief moment, this term oracles of God is really interesting because it's a Greek term. The whole idea of the oracle comes out of Greek mythology, comes out of the idea that, that there's this, this thing in, in Greek mythology that can foretell the future and give these special messages to the people. And Paul borrows that phrase from the Greek mythology to stick it in his letter by inspiration to the Romans to tell the Roman Jews, you had the oracle. But not some mythological oracle in Delphi. You had the oracles of God. Now, interestingly enough, Paul is not the only one to use this terminology. Luke uses it in Acts. Peter uses it in 1 Peter. So at least four times in the New Testament, the term oracles of God is applied to the Old Testament. So what Paul does here says, your advantage was you had the word of God. You were set in charge of them. You were the storekeepers. You had exactly what God wanted. Now, I understand coming up here in about two months, there's an event that happens where husbands, we have to buy gifts for our wives. That's at least what I'm told. And when we do that, what's better? When they say, here's exactly what I want, now go get it, or ah, I don't know what I want this year, just surprise me. That's when you get a vacuum cleaner and nobody's happy. 
when God gave the Jews the old law, the oracles, he said, here is exactly what I want. Here's the blessing. The blessing is you know exactly what God wants and you can give it to him. Now there's the responsibility to the blessing. The blessing is knowing exactly what is wanted. The responsibility is, well, now that we know exactly what is wanted, we have to go get it. We have to give it back to God. But that doesn't negate the advantage of knowing exactly what it is, what God wants. The Jews had that for 1,400 years. Moses wrote about 1,400 B.C., started writing Genesis. And so even though events took place before that, the Jews had it recorded for them by Moses in 1,400 B.C. And they have 1,400 years of having what nobody else has. They have 1,400 years of here's what God wants. While the, the pagan cultures, the Gentile cultures, they kept on in the patriarchal age. And we only read very little in the Bible of how God communicated with the Gentiles. He did communicate with the Gentiles. Don't miss that. But it was very little and very limited, at least to our knowledge, unless it was happening and not being recorded. Jonah was sent to the Gentiles. Balaam wasn't really sent to the Gentiles. Okay, he's probably a bad example, but he was a prophet to the Gentiles. And we read of other times, you know, Naaman becomes a believer. But still, it was all through that patriarchal age, and they did not have exactly what God wanted them to do. Now, the good news is through the grace of God, that was a time that God overlooked Acts 17.30, New King James Version, or gave His gracious wink to, or Old King James Version. God, God still made it possible for them. I don't know how all that works. I'm not God. I just know it was possible. But the Jews still had the advantage because they still had the word. Well, that leads us to the second of six questions in chapter three, but I only get to cover four of them. That's the assignment. So the second question in verse three is, for what if some did not believe? What will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? So the second question is, so what if we failed? What if we didn't believe? Does our unbelief, does our failure, does our lack of faithfulness negate our advantage? And Paul answers with one of his famous answers that he gives several times in the book of Romans. Certainly not. Now, somewhere along the way, someone provided the the, the punctuation for us, and they add that exclamation point. So every time I read it in my head or out loud, I read, certainly not. But I want to give you one suggestion. While I think Paul is emphatic in this answer, I also think he's being a little bit sarcastic. Because I almost think he's saying... You know this. You know our failure doesn't change the greatness of God and His Word and what He gave us. Our failure does not negate that. You know that. I know that. I'm just going to state it so we can all agree and move on. Certainly not. We can't negate what God has done. So, let God be true, verse 4, but every man a liar. And there's, there's the comparison. God is truth. He sets the truth. We fail. God has set the standard that we must follow. And when we go away from that standard, we are the unfaithful. We fail. We have come short of the glory of God. So he's setting that right up at the beginning of the chapter from what he's going to give us in the great pinnacle of the chapter in verse 23. We all fail and fall short of the glory of God because God set the standard. And then, and then Paul starts quoting scripture. Because Paul says that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Quoting from Psalm 51 verse 4, that well-known psalm of David where we assume he is confronting the concept that he has so sinned against God. It is as if he has never done anything right. He has never succeeded. He can't do any good because he has sinned so much surrounding the events with Bathsheba. 
if that is the event that caused that psalm to write, it's really interesting, really interesting that Paul and David both present this as man judging God. Now, we can't judge God. We know that. We know we are too frail to judge God. Of course, that doesn't stop people from still doing it today. But, but we're in no position. However, through inspiration, David and Paul present what happens when we do try to judge God. When we try to judge God, God is justified in his words. Those oracles, he's right. And will overcome. It's no wonder that Romans becomes such a popular study for those who want to, to establish the sovereignty of God because it is established here. When we deny Calvinism, we don't deny the sovereignty of God because he is sovereign and he is in control and he has set the standard. Which brings us to the third question. But... If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. So when we fail, does that mean God has failed? Does that mean God is unjust for setting a standard we can't meet? Is God wrong for, for giving us a challenge that we can't make? Is God wrong... For judging us when we fail. Now these are questions that Paul's bringing up. That again I will suggest to you are still being asked today. And really through the, the, this, this next few verses. Verses 5 through 8. He's actually introducing lots of questions that the skeptics have taken. And rearranged and still were today in some form or fashion. About God. And challenging him. And the skeptical mind that says, who is God to judge me? The problem is, is they, they haven't gone back to verse 4 and realized that if we do try to judge God according to our own standards, God's still righteous and we're still failures. Now, interestingly enough, Paul even adds at the end of verse 5, I speak as a man. Now, he's not negating him being inspired. That's not what he's saying here. He's not trying to say, I'm just throwing this in here uh, off the top of my head. No, he's still being inspired to write this. He's just saying, I'm speaking from the standpoint as a man talking to God in front of an audience. So I'm speaking as a man saying, is God unjust? And again, emphatically, and maybe somewhat sarcastically, Paul says, certainly not. I can't. I can't say God is unjust for punishing those who fail. After the certainly not in verse 6, Paul says, for then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged a sinner? These two verses present these hypothetical questions that, that people still ask. Who is God and why does he get to judge me? How can he set a standard, then create me and say, you didn't meet my standard, and then say, you've done wrong and punish me for it? How can a loving God... You know where I'm going? How can a loving God throw somebody in hell? That's the question he's bringing up. How can God punish us? The simple answer is because he's God. The simple answer is even though we fail... God still is the standard. He still set the oracles. He still put it all out there for us to have. Because even though for 1,400 years the Jews had it and the Gentiles not, we don't live in that age anymore. But now, all men everywhere commanded to repent, Acts 17, 31. We now have the opportunity to know what God wants and to do it. We have the blessing of the list but the responsibility to keep it. God 
can still say you failed because he is still the standard of justice, justice that is outside of our realm of creation that reached inside to our realm of creation and made all of this possible. Now, verse 8, Paul gets personal. He says, And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. Paul adds one more hypothetical question. Why don't we just do wrong? Why don't we keep sinning that grace may abound? Certainly not. That's in chapter 6. Somebody else. That's I've said in context. Okay, so that's somebody else's responsibility. But it's the same question, if not at least very similar, that he's, he's asking in chapter 6 from right here in chapter 3, verse 8. Should we sin so that God's grace will go further, so that God's good will do more, so that, that we can bring about God's plan? No. But actually what he says here is, as some say we go around and preach... I'm in a room with a lot of preachers right now. Has that ever happened to you? Someone come up to you and go, Oh, hey, you're that preacher that says... And you've never said that in your life? <laughs> That's what Paul's addressing here. Apparently, some enemies of Paul had gotten into the congregation in Rome and had said, You know, here's what Paul teaches. Or maybe they're not enemies. Maybe they're just trying to claim false authority. Oh, yeah, Paul agrees with me. That ever happened to you? Hey, the preacher agrees with me. Paul's, whichever case it is, is saying, no, that's not how it works. That's not what I'm doing here. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say we should continue sinning, that grace may abound, or that we should do evil, that good may come. And people who say that, their condemnation is just. Because all condemnation is just. What's easy to do that I found over and over as I've been studying Romans 3 verses 1 through 20 is forget the context that this is to the Jews. And, and what we missed so far in these first eight verses is that the Jews, when you read the Old Testament, are full of failure. They were given the oracles of God. They were given a law that they should follow and that they should keep. And they failed. They failed to the point that they even took the symbols of the false gods of the Canaanites and applied the name of Yahweh to that. They were syncretist of the most worst failing type that we can imagine. As they would go and worship God on Saturday and keep the Sabbath just so and pay their tithes regularly and then go worship Baal Sunday through Friday and say, there's no problem. Or they would bring the symbols of Baal to worship on Saturday and see, look what I'm doing. I'm doing a good thing. Or would you read through the minor prophets and just see how many excuses they came up with? But our husbands say oh, it's okay if we worship the, 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 the uh, queen of heaven. We don't need the authority of God. We have the authority of our husbands. Sorry, men. That's not good enough. The Jews failed over and over. And that's what the Old Testament is a record of. Now, before we do get all high and mighty, remember chapter 1 is written to the Gentiles. They failed too. Uh, we failed too. Everybody's failed. Everybody's fallen short. But that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. As I said already, there's six questions in this chapter. If you're keeping track, we covered three. So we're now to the fourth question. But don't get excited because we're going to spend the majority of our time with this fourth question. This is one of those, the final point is, but don't get excited 
we got a lot of ground still to cover. Because the fourth question in verse 9 is, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jew and Greeks that they are all under sin. So the question is, so can either group? Well, it's specifically to the Jews. So the question to the Jews is, can the Jews say, so we are better than them? Can the Gentiles say, well, we didn't know, so we're better than them? No. Nobody can say they're better than anybody else. Nobody can say that they deserve the gospel more than anybody else. Nobody can say because of my background or my skin color or my job or, or whatever it may be where I live, that we're better than anybody else. Because Paul is laying down the context, for we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here, he just says, we've charged both Jews and Greeks that all are under sin. Read Acts. Read the missionary journeys of Paul and how many times Paul is going into a city and he starts with the Jews. You've messed up. And then Gentiles go, we want to hear more of this. And Paul says, OK, you've messed up, too. Now, the context I'm setting we're really not going to get to the solution to this problem. Uh, that comes in chapter 5. Okay, I'll spoil it for you. The solution to the problem is going to be Christ. The solution to the problem that Paul is painting here is that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and we need something to make this better. We need something to get over this. We need something to fix this sin problem, and we can't. But God did through Christ. Through grace, through faith, through salvation, through obedience, God made it possible. But Paul's not going to answer that way yet. Paul hasn't gotten to that question yet. What Paul's going to do here is just paint how bad our sin problem is. Now he's going to do this in a really interesting way. I know it's 9.30. I know it's early in the morning, but I want to teach y'all a big word I learned. When I learn big words, I like learning big words, so I like teaching them to other people. So here's the big word I learned. Florilegium. We want to all say it together? No? Okay. Florilegium. It's a Latin word. It's a Latin word, flora, com com combination word that has flora in it for flower. Legium means to gather. So the concept behind the word is you're gathering up flowers, like to make a bouquet. Except we're not making a bouquet of flowers. We're making a bouquet of words. In the intertestinal period, from 400 B.C. to the coming of Christ, there, there, the, the, the Latin culture develops and a practice develops amongst the Latin culture to, to have these florilegium. And what they would do with these, excuse me, florilegia, that's the singular, okay, to have these florilegia, and what they would do is they would, they would take writings from all over, different poets, different philosophers, and they would combine them together <clears throat> out of context to prove a point. And this becomes so common that it even becomes common among the Jewish cultures to the point that we just have found scads of these amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have found these florilegium all over the ancient Roman Empire and it, it even is made of scriptures. And so Paul may very well be using a well-known Florigium. <laughs> I practiced a whole lot. <laughs> Florilegia. He may be using one that is well known that when he started saying, they may have been able to recite with him. But what he's done is he's taken verses from Psalms and Isaiah and even a few from Proverbs and he's combined them all together to say, this is what we all know and understand about sin. This is how bad sin can be. Starting in verse 10, it says, as it is written, 
There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongue they have practiced deceit. The poison asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, one more thing about this before we talk about this. This is proof that Paul believed that the Old Testament was inspired. His quoting of the Old Testament proves how he valued the Old Testament and how he felt it was God-given, the holy oracles of God, and he felt that, that it was something that was from God himself. It's a proof of inspiration, and someone says, well, that's you know in, in, internal proof, and, and so that negates it? No. Why wouldn't the Bible present itself as the Word of God throughout? Of course it would. Paul believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. And that at least gives us a starting point to consider it's inspired. And when we put all the evidence together, we'll come to the same conclusion Paul did. The Old Testament is the inspired Word of God, just like the New Testament is. But what did Paul actually say here? Well, he starts, he starts with Psalm 14. A well-known psalm that begins, uh, the fool in his heart has said there is no God, which is also repeated in Psalm 53. So which of those psalms was he's quoting from? Yes. Um, but he's not going to start with that well-known verse at verse 1 of Psalm 14, but he's going to start with verse 3. And verse 3 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. And then what's interesting is then Paul starts going backwards. You know, I almost considered doing that with this lecture, starting in verse 20 and going to verse 1. <laughs> because there's, there's some value in, in doing that because you're, you're working through the argument backwards instead of forwards. And you can kind of take it apart as, as you're going that direction. Because that's what Paul's doing here. Is he starts with verse 3 and then he moves to verse 2 of Psalm 14. Establishing, establishing we've all sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. So yes, we've established that we fail because we're frail. We're the unfaithful ones. We fall short. But then he says, and no one seeks after God? They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now, before we dive again down the rabbit hole of Calvinism and say, this is not talking about the tea of tulip. This is not total hereditary depravity. I don't want to get so lost in that, that we miss what Paul is saying. I think Paul is saying something We've all expressed at one time or another. Have you ever said to somebody, maybe in the heat of a moment, maybe in a discussion, well, I guess I can't do anything right, can I? Nope, just me? Okay. Would you express that in your own terms? I, I mean, typically the day you said that, you probably got out of bed okay and didn't immediately fall over. Or maybe you brushed your teeth and didn't miss any. Or maybe, you know, you showered and got all the shampoo out of your hair. You really did nothing right? Is that really what you mean? And anybody with any reason would go, no, I was using a figure of speech. They probably wouldn't say, no, I was using hyperbole. Maybe they would. That has happened in my house, but I digress. All right. You know, we understand how to use figurative language. We understand when we're talking with each other that, that you know, we, we talk in figures. We're, we're using these figures. And when we say, I guess I can't do anything right, we're not being literal. We're being figurative. 
I suggest to you that the poetry of the Bible is allowed to be figurative because it's poetry and because that's exactly how it was inspired to be used. And so this is not supporting total hereditary depravity. This instead is saying it's as if we've never done anything right because we have sin in our life. And now to a certain extent, there is some truth to that. When we sin and we live in sin, we give ourselves over to sin, we are in sin. And, and there's nothing we can do about it. We can't get out of it. So though we brushed our teeth correctly and we washed all the shampoo out of our hair and we got out of bed successfully and we started the car, and though we've done some good things in the day, as mundane as they may seem, it's as if we've never done anything right because we haven't fixed the major problem in our life. It's as if we're washing the car. We're vacuuming the inside. And we're getting it looking perfect, but we still haven't fixed the engine. And that car's not going to go unless we fix the internal problem instead of the external problem. That's what Paul here is telling them. You've got to fix this internal problem that you've all sinned and you can't do anything about it. Now to drive home the point, he again gets specific. This time quoting in verse 13 from, we've moved on to Psalm 5 and eventually Psalm 140 in the same verse where it says, Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. These are all phrases from poetry saying, here's what they're like. Their throat is like an open tomb. Uh, an open tomb in the ancient world especially was unnatural. If, so, if you walked by and you saw an open tomb, you'd say, that's not right. We need to fix it. We need to do something about that. You didn't leave a tomb open. A mouth full of deceit is a mouth that needs to be closed. It's not natural. It's not how it should be. And so when they feel, fill their tongues with deceit, they're like that open tomb that needs to be closed. Instead, it's open, and what is it putting forth with that deceit? Poison. Isn't that what lies and gossip and, and mouth, uh, sins of the mouth really are? How quickly rumors can poison a group. How quickly rumors can poison a church. Isn't it interesting that Paul just told us he's been falsely accused of saying something he hasn't said? And he says... Sins of the mouth are poison. <laughs> Paul's speaking from experience of seeing it at congregations of people who speak ill of him or people who defraud him and say negative things about him. And, and, and Paul has just seen how it can tear up a congregation when things like that happen. And he, so he calls it what it is. It's poison. It's poison under their lips. And it's something that needs to be removed. If you have poison in you, it needs to be removed. He goes on in verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, quoting from Psalm 10, verse 7. What do we say about somebody who spreads rumors, lies, deceit? I, I've said it. I've said it without even knowing I was fulfilling scripture and saying so. I've said, oh, they're just bitter. Our boy, that person, that's just a bitter person. So many times it's assumed that when someone is spreading all this poison somewhere, it's because in their lives they're not happy. In their lives they're, they're poisoned. And so they want to spread that poison around to others. Scripture supports that concept with saying they're full of cursing and bitterness and it's from the inside and it's just flowing out of them now. It is erupting out of them because they can't keep it in anymore. But Paul moves on in verse 15 to quote from Proverbs 116 or Isaiah 59 verse 7 or 8. And, and this, is, this is where I want to interject something again. 
when you look up these verses in the Old Testament, you're going to notice very quickly that they're not exact quotes of our Old Testament as we have it translated for us from the Hebrew to English. And there's a good reason for that. Paul wasn't quoting from the Hebrew Old Testament here. He was quoting from the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. The Greek translation of the Old Testament made in that intertestinal period, that's where he's quoting from. And that's why the wording won't always match up. That's why the wording will be somewhat different. And you throw in there that there's some translation problems and we're not sure if we have the right word here. We don't know whether to rely on the Hebrew Old Testament or the Septuagint and all that. And if you like getting bogged down in that stuff, I have some recommendations for looking further into that in my lecture. Here's what we can know. Paul's quoting from the Septuagint. That's why the wording is different. Paul's being inspired to quote from the Septuagint. So this is God-approved use of Scripture. And that's what we need to know. And so in this God-approved use of Scripture from Isaiah or Proverbs, he says, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Notice, I, I was going to do this at the, the end, but now, now I'm here and it's on my mind, so I'm going to say it now before I forget. Did I forget? No, I didn't. We've made a progression here. It starts with words. Uh, I, honestly, go back to the very beginning of, of this Florilegium. Just want to say it one more time. Go back to the very beginning of it, and you start. it starts in your mind. It starts from the inside and denial of understanding of who God is. And then we just become denying all of it within ourselves. And then it comes out in our words. And then it becomes our actions. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. It goes from just talking about the evil to doing the evil. To, th there's just a progression through here. Poetically, there's a beauty to it. Spiritually, there's a horror to it. Because we've gone, we've gone from considering to speaking to doing. Swift to shed blood. You know, mid to late 1800s, the scientific case for evolution starts becoming prevalent in society. It gets repeated and repeated, even though it's been refuted and refuted over and over again. It's just repeated until people say, well, if we're going to repeat it so much, let's just believe it. And maybe that will keep everybody quiet and happy. No. It went from thoughts of denying who God is and misunderstanding who God is to words being spread for 150 years to the point that in the 1990s, when I'm in school in Columbia, Tennessee, the school 30 minutes from us in Richland, Tennessee, has the first school shooting that I am aware of. And 25 years later... I hear of school shootings, and to my shame, I go, there's another one. And move on with my day just trying to remember to say a prayer for the families affected by that. It started as an idea of denying God. It became words full of lies and deceit repeated over and over till we get to the point where we have a generation that doesn't understand the sanctity of life and a generation that doesn't want to protect life but instead wants to take life and they are swift to shed blood. That's what sin does. And I'll be honest, that's just one example and it's an example, don't get me wrong, it doesn't make us happy, but it's an example that, that we're comfortable with because it's not us. It's, it's them. It's the evolutionists. It's pointing their fingers at them. But if they can do it, if the Gentiles out there can do it, why can't the Jews in here do it too? Let's be careful not to get so holy that we're pointing at everybody else's faults out there that we miss, that we start with bad ideas that become words that turn into actions that are just as sinful because it's sin.
as what the world does. Because that's the picture Paul is painting. Sin is bad. And that seems too mundane for how bad it really is. That team seems too simple to really illustrate how dangerous and what sin can lead to and why we need a solution. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul quoting from Psalm 36 verse 1 in that last verse. There's a peace that passes understanding. That Paul writes about in Philippians 4. But sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Sin separates us from the peace of God and leads to a tumultuous life, leads to a life where there is no peace, leads, leads to a life where there is no solutions because you get so far away from God. And so peace is not available, especially the peace that passes understanding. And that's how bad sin is. That's why we got to call a sin a sin. And that's why we got to say, yes, it is bad. And that's why we can't wink at it. Because the days of winking at it are over. And we live in the days where all men everywhere are called to repent. No matter whether they were a Gentile sinning or a Jew sinning, a non-Christian sinning or a Christian that's turned back to sin. Sin destroys. Paul concludes these thoughts by saying now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is knowledge of sin so Paul says they had the law they had the advantage they had the oracles of God and you know what it fixed That's what it fixed. Because it couldn't fix sin. It couldn't make up for it. Only God's grace can make up for the sin. There was not a deed they can do that, that would, would make this problem go away. Not under the old law. And not under the new law. Now, don't misunderstand. We don't want to swing the pendulum so far away from law-keeping and pharisaicalism that we pass by the center of where we need to be and get over to grace only. Faith only. Because the center of the thought of what Paul's going to get at in chapters 5 and 6 is simply that we couldn't fix the problem. God did. And now you have to take the solution and apply it to your life. Let me give one more bad human illustration, and Steve's going to come tackle me if I don't quit soon. So, one bad human illustration. Let's say you have some, some disease. I, I, I Choose it in your mind. Okay, got it? All right. And, and so, let's say you have some disease, and I say, if you take this, if you take this, uh, maybe pill or, or solution, or you take this, it's all going to go away. You'll never have it again. You'll never have to deal with it again for the rest of your existence. You will never, because you just take that one thing. You're going to go, thank you so much for this gracious gift. And you're going to walk away without ever taking it out of my hand? Of course not. 
See, my gracious gift of salvation from the disease you're suffering has some requirements, doesn't it? You have to take the solution. You have to put it in your mouth. You have to, if it's a pill, take a little water. You have to do the work of swallowing it. And then you're saved. It's a simple, uneloquent illustration to apply to the most eloquent solution to our biggest problem. Because if it was a physical disease, we would be doing everything we could to fix it. We would do everything we could to fight it to the very last breath of, of our existence. But because this is a spiritual problem, we go, I'll get to it later. Because it's a spiritual problem, we go, ah, is that really the solution? Paul here has said, your worst problem is sin. And the other speakers have already and will continue to give you the eloquent solution of so Christ died for you so that you can have salvation, so that you can apply that in your life through obedience and be rid of it forever. So sin is bad. God is good. And let's take his solution and apply it to our sin so that we can make all of our lives good in the eyes of God. Thank you very much for your attention.